Okay, we're looking at Sefer Agada, page 22. This is a midrash about the life of Noah in life of Noah in in the ark in the teva during the the year or so that he was there. Amur Abutenu Shnei Masa Chodesh Asan Noah Bateva Lo Ta'am Ta'am Shina Lo Hu Ve Lo Banav Lo Bayom Ve Lo Balayla Shaya Asuk Lazun Et Anefashot Shayu Imo. It says for twelve months that Noah is in the teva. He never slept, him or him or his children, day or night, because he had to feed the animals. Some animals. This is Ish Beima. Shaita Uchred B'Sha'a Had Bayom B'Shtaim Shalosh Arba Shli Shalayla Em Tzaro Shalayla Ve'Ish Bekirat Gaver. So it's like each animal eats at a different time. Some are nocturnal, some are diurnal, some eat at midnight. So he has to be there to feed them all. He's the only zookeeper for thousands of, uh, of species. So, and they ask, Ume Ayama Achilan, and what would he feed them? Kol min vamin lefei shehaya lamud. He had to give each uh, animal what it used to eat. Hay for the camels, uh, branches or like... Uh, Leaves for the for the elephants, se'orim lahamorim, barley for the donkeys, and zchuchit lenaamiot, and glass for the uh, for the ostrich. So, but this obviously is a uh, batiana. No. Oh, okay. So it's an example that you know I said several times. We have to be careful when we see what is sort of scientific facts in uh, um, in midrashic literature. In many cases, the rabbis borrowed whatever they knew about zoology or, or the physical world from the writings of the Greeks. So it is known that uh, ostriches swallow things just like uh, small birds swallow stones in order to digest what's in their, in their belly because they have no teeth. That's the, it's called in, uh, in Hebrew zephek. One of the parts of the, of the, of the of birds is when you find a chicken... Is uh, and you find in the gizzard that if you, when you clean it, you'll you'll see that they're a little like uh, sand. You know where did the sand come from? It's small stones or stuff like that that they use in order to grind the food in their in their stomach. Yeah. So bigger birds like the the ostrich would uh, would swallow anything, and they specifically like shiny things. So actually, it's known that people in uh, uh, in Africa and other places where where you have ostriches would would train them. To swallow shiny objects, as basically they were their their accomplices in in theft. So uh, Greek naturalist, and then later on the Romans like Pliny the Elder, would uh, you know watched only one part of the behavior. They didn't follow the birds constantly, and they you know watched every detail of their behavior. And they thought that uh, this is this is really the diet of the bird. So just a side interesting side comment, and but it's important because. When you go into halakha literature, in many cases, uh, ra- even modern rabbis quote and cite what the rabbis wrote 2,000 years ago as if it is halakha le Moshe Misinai, and this is how the world operates. And we have to be careful with that. How about the lions and tigers? No, okay, so don't even mention lions and tigers. We really have to understand, we really have to think of that when the Torah speaks about the flood, and Noah's flood as, uh, uh, you know, Noah gathers all the animals into the, into the ark. Either the Torah refers only to a select group of animals from a select, a very limited territory, or this whole story is a metaphor. Because you just go to a normal zoo that gives you uh, a, a, a glimpse of maybe 1% of the world's population of animals, you know how much space you need for that. To really bring into one ark all the animals is impossible. Com- completely impossible. So that, that's another question, like what exactly is meant by the story. But the interesting thing is like when, when the rabbis really tell us how, how difficult it was for, for Noah uh, to maintain the, uh, to take care of the animals. And like the, your question, it says, Pamahat shahan Noah lazun etari ve'hikisho ve'yatsa tzolea. Ve'zehu shenemar ve'yisha erach Noah. So that uh, the rabbi said one time Noah was delayed in feeding the lion. He's running around. He has a very busy schedule. They didn't have yet the app for managing the ark. You know, today probably they have, you know, uh, 
the ark, hour, uh, the hours and everything. So he had to run like, and he gets late to the to the lion's den, and the lion is hungry, and and the lion uh, hits or or bites the uh, bites Noah, and that's Vayishar Ach Noah. Noah remained alone, but the rabbis were the word Ach, as you know, say when you were in pain, Ach. Vayishar Ach Noah. Right. Yeah. So then we know that the, whoever wrote this pasuk. Was not Moroccan because then he would have written Vaishar Ayyuma Noah, right? <laughs> that would be the pasuk. That's always what I say when I get bitten by a lion. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, man, why'd you do that for? Right. <clears throat> but interesting, what, what the rabbis really bring into light is that they, we always think of the, of the ark and Noah being saved as a miracle. God, uh, Hashem says, like that you've, uh, you found grace. In my eyes, you're a special person. So you ask the question, if Noah is such a special person, why doesn't God save him in a more pleasant way? Right? Get him, give him one mountain top, tell him, you know, go to the peak of Mount Ararat and, and build a little farm, get all the animals there, and I will make sure that the water doesn't rise above that level. That would be much, much easier. They would have open space, open air. They could grow more food for the animals. Give them one little mountain. Now, it doesn't take much. So the answer, I think, that they have to see in the context of the whole story is that Noah, even though he's praised as a righteous man in, his gen- in, in that generation, is not really a role model for us to follow because Noah was self-centered. Noah only cared about himself. What would, should have been the natural reaction of someone who's being told, I'm going to wipe out the whole world? Whether it's a tzaddik or not. Please. Please. Uh, wipe out yeah, Abraham. no, it's you impossible. Like right, like Avraham Avinu. But I think even regular people like us, we would have thought, this is, this is inappropriate. Please, this is not right. It. Don't do that, right? But no, but no, okay, what should I do to save myself? Go build the Tevai. He goes and he builds the ark. Now, to say that without any. Uh, Support from the Torah or the Tanakh would be difficult, but we have two things that support that. One is the actions, what I mean, the way Noah felt after the flood, because the, when he leaves the Teva, the first thing he does it says Vayachir Noah Isha Adama Vayitakarim. The first thing he does is he plants a vineyard. Now, it's not; it's a deliberate act. It's not something that he does uh, haphazardly, because you know that to to harvest the grapes from the vineyard and to make wine is a process. So I mean, Noah was very keen on I need, I need a glass of wine. <laughs> I need some alcohol here. Right? So the first thing he does, okay, wait, before you even unpack the teva, first thing, let's, let's, you know, save time, go plant a vineyard. He takes care of the vineyard, it takes him a couple of years until he produces wine. Even that, you know, he has to wait for the wine to ferment. And what is it? Once he has it, he gets drunk, and he lies na- naked in his tent. Why? Because he's devastated. Be- only in retrospect, in the, when I did the story, in retrospect, he, he looks around and he realizes that he's the, the only person left in the world with his, with his tiny family, and he let or uh, stood by idly when God destroyed the world, did nothing. Realize when, let's say he, has, he lived in a neighborhood, he walked through the neighborhood, and he says that everything is devastated. You know, that people who go to Detroit... No, right? I mean, this is a, it became a symbol, the city of Detroit, without physical destruction, just being abandoned. How people feel terrible, it became a symbol of the uh, economic financial decline of America because I think uh, at a certain point, 75% of the city has been abandoned. So imagine if you go through a city like that, and it has not been abandoned by people who are still alive, but everybody died. It's terrible. And Noah looks around and he thinks this is what happened, you know. Uh, so, and, and that's also why he gets so upset, I think, with his son, Ham. When Ham walks in on him and sees him naked, and he goes and he tells his brothers outside, what happened there? The rabbis, the, the commentators are perplexed because they say, that, what, what did he do? Why is he so upset? No, he's upset. He curses him. So they say he raped him. He castrated him. Uh, it's not written in the pasuk. His grandson. No, Ham did that. He, Noah cursed his grandson. But the one who saw him was... I mean, Noah 
cursed his grandson Canaan, but the one who saw him was, was Ham. Uh, it says, Vayar Ham et Arvat Noah Haviv, Vayaged Lishnei Hav Bahutz. So he, he, he went and he spoke to his brothers. Uh, the rabbi, the commentator, had to make it a big sin, a, a grave sin. Otherwise, you can understand the, the curse. But if you look at it in, in this uh, in this light, that Noah failed to care for humanity, and then realized after the mabul, after the flood, what how insensitive he was. Now that that Ham walks in and treats him with complete insensitivity, goes out and, and makes fun of him. He says he's upset at himself and at his education that he wasn't able to instill in his children this uh, uh, basic respect for other people. And he sees it as his own failure. I think when he lashes out and he, and, he, and, he, and he curses his grandchild, it's almost like cursing himself because he's upset at what he did. Uh, and that's why when Hashem saves Noah, He doesn't save him in a way which is comfortable or at least a bearable, but in a very difficult way. You have to work a whole year to to build the teva, to build the ark, or who and who knows? Actually, it doesn't say in the, the is, it's right. I'm, I'm sorry. This was yeah. it's not written in the Torah how long it took him. the The midrash says it took him 120 years. Uh, maybe if he got it from IKEA, it probably would take 120 years because every time he puts one part, it falls. He has to. <laughs> Can't the yeah, I could understand that. I wonder what the teva his name would be if it was made in the in in that by Ikea, you know, smorgasbord maybe. Uh, anyway, uh, he has to to do all that, work hard for whatever long, and then bring all the animals in and be locked in with all the animals and his family for a year. So he realizes what it means to take care of others, whether humans or animals. Now, the proof from the Tanakh that this interpretation is correct is that in Sefer Yehezkel, the Navi talks to the people and says that uh, there are different situations where God would come and save humanity. And he says, but if there were three righteous people in a generation and the rest would be sinners, the generations would not be saved. And who are the three righteous people that the Haskell mentions? Noah, Eov, and Daniel. What is the connection between those three? So Daniel obviously is mentioned because the, he, he was someone of recent memory. People knew of Daniel at the time of Yehezkel. But Noah and Eov, Noah and Job, what is the connection between them? <clears throat> the connection is that both were people who did not influence their environment. Noah did not care when Hashem says, I'm going to destroy the world. Yov, when what we only see it through the story, how the story uh, unfolds, but when Yov starts suffering, what is the first thing his wife tells him? Barech Elohim Vamut. You have to rebel against God, curse God, so he will kill you. And what does he tell her? Kedaber ahat nevalot adaberi. You talk like one who has no education or no respect. But she's his wife. Right, right. Should we only accept the good and not the evil? But wait a second. But she's also, his wife. But also, Eov <coughs> specifically did not want to save the people of Yavne. Because they, because no, that's Midrash. Let me Midrash. Yonah. Yonah, Yonah. Yonah, Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. yeah. It's a different story. A, yeah. Right. But, so, uh, Eov, Eov <laughs> lives with his wife for many years. He has seven children. Uh, sorry, ten children, seven uh, boys and, and three girls. So probably they were married for at least uh, you know twenty years. During that time, he would have been able to influence her somewhat to see to have his perspective of the world. But no, he didn't. And also with his children, the, the Navi says that the children, his children would have the siblings would have parties once a month or once a week, and after the party. Eov would bring sacrifices for all of them, saying maybe they cursed God. This is, not, this is sort of a, of a cover-up. Let me bring sacrifices for them, because maybe they did something wrong. Why would they do something wrong? You have to sit and talk to them. They're, I mean, edu- his education was not, uh, did, not became, did not become something intrinsic and internal, but rather it was external. <coughs> the other proof from Tanakh, and we say it in the... Uh, one of the Aftarot, and also it's mentioned in the Tefillot, 
כי מי נוח זאת לי אשר נשבעתי מעבור עוד מי נוח על הארץ. God says, I swore that I will not bring flood again, but the flood is not called flood, it, call, it is called me noah, the waters of noah, right? You don't want to be remembered as the man, you know, the man of the flood. The, the, the fact that Torah, the Navi calls him the flood, me noah, sort of like puts the blame on him. So I think that's part of the Midrash, that the Midrash uh, uh, describes no, the life condition of Noah with such detail to tell us that uh, Noah is not the ideal person, is not the role model. He should have uh, treated the whole situation differently, pray for the people like Abraham did uh, with the story of Sodom. Okay,